And today our text is Romans 8, verses 12 to 14. Waging war on sin. Waging war on sin. Okay. Is everyone found it in the scripture? Romans chapter 8? Let's read our text. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. So then, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Dash. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sent mm-hmm. Oh Lord, bless your word today to your people. Lord, you are the great shepherd and they are your sheep and they need food. Feed them, Lord. Feed them today that they would wage war on sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm. I'm going to open up the message today by reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 which says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Fleshly lusts wage war against the soul. Now if that's true, if sin wages war against you, then you have to wage war against your sin. The great Puritan theologian John Owen from the 17th century says... If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It tells us he's coming to a climax and he's concluding a thought. The thought starts in verse 5 and runs through verse 11. And he says, so then, based on all I've told you in these verses, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Dash. Now, not all the versions that are out there have the dash there, but the New American Standard Bible does. And what that dash tells you is that Paul never finishes his sentence. He goes back to saying what he originally was going to say. Now, almost all scholars believe that what Paul set out to say was, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but we are under obligation to the Spirit to live according to the Spirit. He never gets there because he thinks about why we're not under obligation to the flesh, and it takes him down this trail by telling us we're not under obligation to the flesh because if we live according to the flesh, we're going to die. Our flesh never did anything for us. Our flesh has been trying to kill us since the day we were born. And what he's saying is that we must not join forces with the enemy to bring about our own destruction. The only thing we owe the flesh is warfare. If Christ hadn't saved us, our flesh would have dragged us down to the deepest, darkest, hottest place in hell. Mm -hmm. So, we are under no obligation to make provision for the flesh or to live according to the flesh. We are not under obligation to the flesh, but we are under obligation to the Holy Spirit. Now why? Why are we under obligation to the Spirit? Well, he's been telling us that in chapter 8. In verse 2, he tells us that the Holy to fulfill the requirement of God's law. In verse 6, he says the Holy Spirit brings about life and peace. In verses 9 through 11, he says the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and the Holy Spirit has made our spirit alive. And then in verse 11, he says the Spirit is going to raise our mortal bodies from the dead one day. So the Holy Spirit has done everything for us, and that's why we are under obligation to the Spirit, to live according to the Spirit. So I'm really glad that Paul went off on a tangent, because when he went, goes off on this tangent, he teaches us something really, really important. And it's about putting sin to death. And what happens if we live a life where we do not put sin to death? Now, the King James talks about the mortification of sin. It's a, it's, it's a word we seldom use today. Occasionally someone will say, oh, when that happened, I was just mortified. What do they mean? I was embarrassed, or I was humiliated, or I was ashamed. But the original meaning of the word mortified means to put to death. 
It doesn't mean to be ashamed. It means to put something to death. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about believers putting sin to death. The mortification of sin. So today we're going to ask some questions of our text. And hopefully we're going to get some biblical answers to those questions. Question number one is, who must kill their sin? Who? In verse 13, Paul says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Who must kill their sin? You. But who is the you that he's talking to? That's the question. Well, it's the same you of verse 9. Who is not in the flesh, but in the spirit. It's the same you in verse 10 that Christ is in. Christ is in you. It's the same you in verse 11. The spirit of God dwells in. And whom the spirit of God is going to raise their mortal body from the dead. And in verse 10, or excuse me, verse 12, it's the same you that he calls brethren. So there's no doubt about it. Paul's not writing to non-Christians. He's addressing believers in verse 13 when he tells them to put sin to death. And that makes sense because how is a person who's dead in sin going to put sin to death? So here's the answer to the question. Who must kill their sin? If you're a Christian, you must kill your sin. You must do it. And notice that Paul puts the responsibility for killing sin squarely on the shoulders of the Christian. He doesn't say... If the spirit puts to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There's a responsibility on us to put sin to death. Now, we cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit will not do it without you. There is a mutual cooperation in the mortification of sin. There's, there's a role that we play in the killing of sin in our lives. Now, what's true about the person that Paul is exhorting to put sin to death? Well, let me give you a couple of truths about that person. Number one, he is a person for whom Christ died. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he's a person for whom Christ died. Christ died to pay the penalty for that person's sins. But not only that, he's a person that died with Christ. This is a truth that is not as easy to understand and is something we don't think about all that often. But in Romans chapter 6, Paul spells it out for us. In verse 2, he says, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So he's saying, Believer, that our old self was crucified with him, that is Christ, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. He died with Christ. Our old self was crucified. You see, when we were united to Jesus Christ in the new birth, there was that living union that took place. We partook of Jesus' history. What happened to Jesus happened to all those who were in him. And when he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he rose, we rose. When he ascended, we ascended. When he sat down at the right hand of God, so we. So, what's true about the person that Paul's exhorting to put sin to death? He's a person for whom Christ died, and he's a person that died with Christ. The you of verse 13 that is to put sin to death is a new creation. He's a person who has been cut off out of the tree of Adam and grafted into the tree of Christ. He's a person who has died with Christ and has been risen with Christ. He's a person with a new nature. He's a person who dwelt with the Holy Spirit. He's a person who has been born again. You ever see those giant jumbo jets and wonder how in the world they ever get into the air and stay there without falling out of the sky and crashing? I mean, these things weigh a million pounds. They're 500 tons. 500 tons of steel just floating through the air. You know, it's amazing. How does that happen? Well, if, if that jumbo jet didn't have any wings, all it was was this narrow tube with some tires on it and a jet engine, I don't care how fast it goes, it's never going to get into the air, right? 
right. It's just going to be like a, a race car. We're going down the runway. But you put wings on it, and all of a sudden, it can lift <laughs> off into the air. What needs to happen to that jet engine is it needs to be reconfigured. Someone's got to put some wings on it. And something's got to be done to the center. God's got to reconfigure the center so that he can fly. What needs to happen is he has to be a new creation. God's got to give him a new nature. He's got to be born of the Spirit so that he can fly. Otherwise, he's earthbound. So, we have to do something. We have to wage war on sin. We must not let sin reign in our lives. We must kill in ourselves what killed Christ. Here, here's the formula. Jesus was killed for your sin. You were killed in him. So, kill sin in yourself. That's what the book of Romans says. Jesus was killed for your sin. You were killed in Jesus. Now, kill the sin that remains within you. Just because you died to sin does not mean sin died to you. Mm -hmm. Sin is still prevalent. There is still remaining sin in our lives. Yes, the old self was crucified, but there's still a battle that you face every single day of your life. You must fight the good fight of faith. So the answer to the first question, who must kill sin, is you. You must do it. Why must we kill our sin? Well, look at verse 13. It's because if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The words we want to focus on are die and live. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you're living according to the Spirit and putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, what does he mean by die and live? What kind of death is he talking about when he says, if you live according to the, death, to the flesh, you must die? He can't be talking about physical death. Because everybody dies physically, whether you live according to the flesh or according to the Spirit. Your bodies are going to die. So this is not talking about bodily death. It's not talking about physical death. Well, then what kind of death is he talking about? He's talking about eternal death. Mm -hmm. It's the same death he was talking about in Romans 6.23, when he said the wages of sin is death. And he contrasts death with eternal life, which is the free gift of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is the opposite of eternal life? It's eternal death. So what Paul is talking about in Romans 8.13 is eternal punishment, eternal separation from God. He's talking about hell. If you go on living according to the flesh, you will perish, you will die, you will end up separated from God in a place the Bible refers to as hell. That's why we must kill our sin. Because if we don't kill our sin, that's what will happen to us. What does he mean by live? But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. No, it's the opposite of die. It's eternal life. You will inherit and enjoy everlasting life with God. So what we find here is that eternal life and eternal destruction are at stake in killing sin. Paul is not teaching that if a believer falls into sin, he forfeits his salvation. He's not teaching that. Notice the tenses of the verbs. If you are living, if you are putting to death, in the Greek those are present tense verbs, and in the Greek a present tense verb means ongoing continual acti activity. So Paul's not talking about an occasional fall into sin from which the believer repents. He's talking about a lifestyle where you live according to the flesh, you go on living continually according to the flesh, or you go on continually putting to death the deeds of the body. It's either continuous activities, lifestyle activities. Now, you say, well, Brian, is Paul really teaching? That if a professing Christian lives according to the flesh, he will perish under the wrath of God? Is he really saying that? Well, if this was the only place in the Bible that taught that, I would be, I would say, well, maybe I'm misunderstanding verse 13. Maybe it doesn't mean that. 
But the problem is that it teaches that in many places mm -hmm. in Scripture. Not just here. But Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace and the sanctification without which no man will see the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now you understand that word sanctification? It's another word for holiness. Mm -hmm. Pursue holiness. If you are not pursuing holiness, the Bible says you won't see the Lord. You won't be in heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, For do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters at the bridge, do not be deceived when you listen to Christian radio or the Christian podcast, and some preacher is telling you, well, once saved, always saved. You're secure in Christ. It doesn't matter how you live, because at six years old, you walk down an aisle and answer an altar call. You're saved. It doesn't matter if you go on and become a, a rapist and a murderer. You, you, you got your ticket to heaven. Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators. Folks, if anybody in this room today is living a lifestyle of fornication, listen up. Because Paul has something to say to you. If you're living a lifestyle of adultery, listen up. Adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, cheats, inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's like black and white. I don't know how we can make it any more clear than that. Don't be deceived. I don't want you to get mixed up by sending, thinking you can live this kind of a life and still go to heaven. You can't. Verse 10, or excuse me, verse 11. Such were some of you. You used to be fornicators and adulterers and homosexuals and thieves. I know, I know your past, I know your lot, but you were sanctified. Mm. <laughs> you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. God transformed you. You're no longer the same person you once were. Amen. And that's not the only place either. Let me show you one more. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5. Amen. Verse 5. And Paul again, notice how he puts this. Ephesians 5.5. 5. For this you know with certainty. And the problem is there are many preachers today that don't know this with certainty. But Paul knew it with certainty. And he knew the Ephesians knew this with certainty. That no immoral or impure person, or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Amen. Don't. Who cares what words they're spewing at you? They're empty. They're false. They're vain. They're not according to truth. Because on account of these things, what's going to come upon the sons of disobedience? The wrath of God. I don't care if you make a profession of faith. I don't care if you've been baptized. I don't care if you attend the bridge church every Sunday morning. If you're living this kind of a life, the Bible says you're going to see the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. Man. So that's what's at stake in Romans 8.13. Heaven and hell are at stake. Mm -hmm. Now, is Paul teaching a Christian can lose their salvation? Is that what he's teaching? Well, I don't think so because of other things he says in this very same chapter, like Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or, verse 30, And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So if everyone that God justifies gets glorified, then that means there's no losing of your salvation between justification and glorification. Everybody who's justified also gets glorified. Or, verse 38 and 39, that says that he's convinced that there's nothing that can separate a believer from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if Paul's not teaching that a Christian can lose their salvation, what is he teaching? Is he teaching that killing sin is the way we get saved? No. It's the way God shows you that you are saved. It's the evidence that God has saved you. Killing sin in your life is not the root of your salvation. It's the fruit Amen. of your salvation. Amen. It's not the cause of your salvation. It's the effect 
It's not the ground of it. It's the evidence of your salvation. It's the absolutely necessary evidence of your salvation. Because no unsanctified people will be going to heaven. So we are not saved by killing sin. But when we do kill sin in our lives, it shows that we are saved because the Spirit of God dwells within us. The Spirit is working within us to kill sin. You see, God uses not only promises, but warnings of the Bible. A worldly professing Christian could read Romans 8.13, and they say, well, that doesn't apply to me. That's not talking about me. It says here, if I'm living according to the flesh, I must die. Well, that's not me, because once saved, always saved. I'm secure. I don't need to worry about that. That's talking about somebody else. But the true child of God trembles when he reads mm -hmm. verse 13. He trembles that somehow he may <coughs> miss God. And he flies to Jesus Christ. And he prays. He begs God for the power to kill sin in his life. The true child of God, that's how he reacts. So if you can read verse 13 and nonchalantly go on your way and say, well, that's, I don't have to worry about that. Trump, be afraid. Because maybe you aren't a child of God. The person who kills sin by the power of the Spirit proves that he's a child of God. That's what verse 14 is telling us. Look at verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Yeah. Well, who are the people who are being led by the Spirit of God? They're the ones that are doing verse 13. Did you notice how verse 14 begins, Bible students? For. The word for means because. Verse 14 is an explanation of verse 13. Verse 13 says you've got to put to death the deeds of the body in order to live. Why? Because, I'll tell you why, all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these and these only are sons of God. These and these only are those who are saved. So when Paul says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, he means that the Holy Spirit is leading a person to put sin to death in his body. That's what he means by being led by the Spirit. We, we might read verse 14 and think, oh, he means that I have a vision or a dream or an impression that I should marry this person or move to that city or take that job or go to that college. He's not talking about that. In context, he's talking about putting sin to death. Amen. The Holy Spirit is holy, and the Holy Spirit leads believers into holiness. Amen. Amen. So, the person who kills sin by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to verse 14, proves that the Holy Spirit is leading him, and it proves that he's God's child. But if you are not putting sin to death in your life, and you're just indulging the flesh and living according to the flesh, that's a sign that you are headed for eternal destruction. So that is why we must kill our sin. Heaven and hell are at stake in this. Third question of the text. So what does it mean for us to kill our sin? What does it mean? Well, first of all, what is meant by the deeds of the body? Let's focus on that in verse 13. We are to put to death the deeds of the body, it says. This can't mean all the deeds of the body, because many of the deeds of the body of the Christian are pleasing to God. We know that from... Romans 6, verse um, 12 and 13. He says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you would obey its lusts, and don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So in the Christian's life, the members of his body can be instruments of righteousness, or instruments of unrighteousness. So when he talks about putting to death the deeds of the body, he's talking about the deeds that flow from the members of unrighteousness. In other words, when evil deeds, when sinful deeds flow from the members of your body, those are the deeds that must be put to death. That's why the NIV translates this verse, the misdeeds of the body. 
we are to put to death the misdeeds. Mm -hmm. Or the New Living Translation says, we are to put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that flow out of the members of your body, like your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your feet, your hands. They're sinful. When you look upon that which you ought not look upon. When you intentionally listen to those things you ought not listen to. When you speak evil things. When your feet take you to places of temptation. Or you use your hands for violence or for harm rather than serving the good. These are the deeds of the body that must be put to death. Alright, so what is meant by putting to death? Well, I believe it's something like choking or strangling. If someone strangles another person to death, the person doesn't die instantly. It takes time. But they've got a choke hold on them. And they choke, and they choke, and they choke. And the person being choked gets weaker and weaker and weaker until finally they can't breathe at all and they die because they have, can't take a breath. Paul's saying, put your sins to death. Choke them. Put a choke hold on them. Until they get weaker in your life. And weaker in your life. Until finally you have power over that sin. And it doesn't bother you like it once did. It has no power over you. Now, admittedly, this language is not... It's not a pretty picture. You're talking about killing things. Putting, like when you go to a crime scene, that's not a pretty picture. There's blood all over the place. And it's, it's a terrible thing. No one enjoys, I think, going to the scene of a crime where someone has been killed. It's shocking. It's repulsive. And I think it's intentionally that way because it illustrates how God views sin. We might look at sin, and the devil paints it as very pretty, attractive, fun. But when God looks at sin, he sees something that is ugly and repulsive and hateful and offensive. Like a crime scene. Shocking. Sin is so ugly that it has caused the death of billions of people throughout the history of the world. And it is so ugly that it caused the death of the only infinitely worthy sacrifice, Jesus Christ. So, the conclusion is, what does it mean for us to kill our sin? It means to attack it and choke it and pinch the pipeline until that sin starts to lose its power in your life, until it decreases its strength, it gets weaker and weaker, and you eventually ascend to have victory and power over it. So when we meet sin, we've got to meet sin with the sword. We must make no truce with it, make no compromise with it, and take no prisoners. Over in Romans 13, he says that we are to make no provision for the lusts of the flesh in regard thereof. Make no provision. If you know something is a sin in your life, you don't allow provision for that thing. Cut it off. It's like two gladiators who are fighting in a Roman Colosseum. You have 50,000 people in the stands. They're looking down. They see these two gladiators fighting. And basically, this is a fight to the death. One person is going to remain alive. The other one's going to be dead at the end of that fight. It was a fight to the death. That's the same way it is with a Christian. We're fighting sin to the death. Either sin will kill us or we will kill sin. We're gladiators. Mm -hmm. Paul felt like he was a gladiator. He is, at the end of his life, he says, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He said, I won. I fought sin and I won. I fought it. And I want every one of us to be able to say the same thing on our deathbed. I fought the good fight. I put sin to death. Well, that brings us to our final question. How? Do we kill our sin? How do we do it? Well, I want you to notice the comparison between verse 6 and verse 13. Verse 6 says, For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Verse 13 says, For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die, but if by the spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
you see certain things that keep occurring in both verses. Flesh and spirit are in both verses. Life and death are in both verses. But he says, the mindset of the flesh is death. That's parallel to if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. Then he says, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace, which is parallel to, but if by the spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If we're right about seeing these as parallel verses, that would mean that setting your having the mind set on the spirit is parallel to putting to death the deeds of the body. Do you see where I'm getting that? It's from the second part of verse 13 and comparing that to the second part of verse 6. The mindset of the flesh is to, by the spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. So, if that's true, then we have to set our mind on the things of the spirit in order to put to death the deeds of the body. Now, what are the things of the spirit that we are to set our minds on? Ephesians 6, 17. When Paul talks about the armor of God and the battle that we are to fight, he says, and take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the only offensive weapon. It's the only weapon that is used to kill the sword. And what is it? The word of God. The sword of the spirit. So to set our mind on the things of the spirit, I believe, is to take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and to set our mind on on the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. We do battle against sin with the Word of God. That's what Jesus did when he was tempted by the devil, right? Mm -hmm. When the devil tempted him, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he battled with the Word of God against the devil. Now there's another thing we need to keep in mind as well. And we get this principle from Galatians 3, 5. Paul says, does he who provides the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. Now, what's the obvious answer? Hearing with faith. And that's interesting. Hearing with faith. Hearing because what they had to believe was the word of God that was being spoken to them. So the way God was working amongst them was through them hearing and responding with faith. So, this battle that God has called us to fight against sin, it's not just us saying, no, when sin presents itself to us. Now, we have to do that. And that's part of it. But that's not all of it. That's like the negative aspect to it. The positive aspect of this is that we need to set our minds on the things of the Spirit to do battle against the deeds of the body. We need to take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And what I mean by that is that we need to Trust in the promises of God in the moment that sin is presenting itself to us as being more satisfying and superior than the promises that sin makes to us. It's like this lamp over there. We've got a plug. The lamp is not going to shine unless you take the plug and stick it into the wall. Well, our plug is our faith. The socket is the word of God. When we take our faith and attach it, plug it into the word of God, power is released. There, there's power available in this house, electrical power. But you can't make yourself, you can't avail yourself of it unless you plug it in. And our faith needs to be plugged into the word and God's power works through that. It works through faith in God's word. So if you want to see the power of God working in your life, you need to have faith in the promises of the Word of God. In Romans chapter 1, when we were going through Romans 1 32 sermons ago, <laughs> I gathered them up this morning, 32 sermons ago, we were talking about Romans 1, and there Paul tells us that the root of sin is to prefer anything or something other than God. Because the people of Romans 1 exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So when you get it, boil it all down, the root of sin is to prefer something, anything other than the, the true and living God. If that's true, if sin is the preferring of something other than God, then to, the way we do battle with sin is to believe the promises of God that tell us 
that God is better than what sin promises in that moment. What do I mean? Well, let me just give you a sampling of some promises that you can tuck away. I, I want to exhort you to be people of the book. Be people of the Bible. Be people that are in the Word of God daily. I, I want to exhort you this morning to have your own prayer journal, uh, something you can write in. When God gives you a promise as you're reading through the Word, jot it down. Commit it to memory. Think about that. Brother Anthony was telling me how he's memorizing Psalm 1. I was so happy to hear that. He's tucking away God's word in his heart. Let's be people of the book. But here, here's some sampling of promises that can equip you. It's like putting a sword in your hand when the enemy comes against you. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In context, Paul was talking about being content when he had very little. I can be content when I have very little. I'm in prison, but I'm content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Hebrews 13.5 Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2.12-13 Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Tell yourself that. God is at work in me, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He hasn't left me on my own. He hasn't deserted me. He hasn't forsaken me. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So we need to arm ourselves with promises in the word where the promises of God give us more than the promises of sin. Sin promises you temporary enjoyment for a time. But what happens after that? Guilt, shame, having to go to God with your tail tucked between your legs and just confess, man, I'm so sorry I did that. Please forgive me. Um, if, if your sin happens to be drinking or drugs, you wake up the next day with a hangover, you get addicted to that drug and you're in bondage to it. I mean, sin only has a very temporary fleeting pleasure and then it's just that. It's all negative. Amen. Promises of God are holy, Amen. beautiful, Amen. joyful, Amen. And satisfying, Amen. and life-giving. So, brothers and sisters, arm yourself with God's word and fight with it. Take up the sword of the Spirit when the sin comes against you and fight with all your might. Fight the good fight of faith. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd make each one of us here today deadly serious about waging war on our sin. We would not become complacent in any sin in our lives. Lord, the ones, those sins that you reveal to us, we, we pray that we would fight them. Give us victory, Lord. Help us to, to choke, to strangle until that, that sin starts loosening its grip and the life starts flowing out of it. And we can, we can tread upon it. Just like the Joshua tread upon the necks of those ten Canaanite kings that he had slaughtered in the day of battle. Lord, help us to tread upon sin. In Jesus' name we pray.